So, and I asked last night if there was anyone who would fess up to being a Donald Trump supporter. I didn't get anyone to actually confess. Or, a Do or Ted Cruz, Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders. As I say these names, it evokes emotion. And why is that? It's because this is a, this is a partisan time. Look at our candidates. And I can tell you a striking thing that I've observed. And that is that whereas there is such polarity in almost every walk of life, when it comes to education, I'm noticing some congruence, some convergence. So I want to talk to you about that today. And what we're converging around is this. It's up to our generation to usher in the new era of schooling. We're starting to converge on that belief as a people. I truly think we are. We're starting to converge on the belief that it is up to our generation, meaning you and me, the people in this room and the other like-minded individuals who are increasingly common, to retire the factory model of schooling that served us well in the industrial age and to usher in a student-centered model that will serve us better in the networked age. It's up to us. So the first time that I noticed this convergence was in 2013 when a nonprofit in Washington, D.C. that's actually called Convergence. And their thing is they bring together warring factions. So they bring together groups that in the past have butted heads. And they try to help them find peace so that they can move forward and, and start to move through problems. So they decided they were going to do this with education. They are going to tackle education. So they brought in the most unlikely collaborators. They brought in Diana Ravitch from the uh, American Teachers Federation, Lily Eskelson from the National Education Association, the biggest teachers unions, um, and then Giselle Huff from the Jacqueline Hume Foundation, who is more of a capitalist, and everyone in between. And it was truly an unlikely, improbable group to find any common ground. And yet they, found, they spent that first meeting discussing, is there anything we all can agree to in education? And what they determined by the end of the meeting was that, indeed, there was. And that was that everyone in the room cared about the outcomes for children. Everyone in the room wanted our children to live happy, successful lives and to have happy, successful outcomes in their lives. And so that was, that was the common ground. And they left meeting one feeling pretty good that they'd figured that out. So then they met a couple of other times. And in the course of those meetings, they arrived at these other commonalities. The first was they all agreed we are no longer in the industrial age. We're now more in the network age. So we've, the reference point for our schools up until now has really been the factory model and the assembly line. A more appropriate reference point moving forward would be the networked model and lateral connections. And if, whereas in the past, our goals were really school-centric, meaning that the elements of the architecture were optimized to allow for a high-functioning, standardized school. That was the target. That's what we're aiming for. Now, what we're looking for is student-centered, meaning that the elements of the architecture are adaptable to adapt to the individual needs and abilities and interests and circumstances and frameworks of the students who are entering our building every morning. And whereas in the past, the elements of the system included things like age-based cohorts and linear curriculum and schools that were based roughly like a factory and the idea of students who are empty vessels waiting to be filled, now the elements that we're talking about for this new paradigm of student-centered learning are things like competency-based learning, personalized learning, Student agency, the ability to, to own your own learning and manage your own journey. Uh, the idea of, of students having open walls, so they're not only learning within their socially embedded context where we're still interacting with technology but with each other, but they're also the walls are open so we're interacting with our community. And there's apprenticeships and internships and museums and, and all of the things that the community can offer. And so those are the paradigms that this group through convergence said, we actually agree on more than we thought. It was breakthrough, breakthrough for these leaders to actually agree to some of these things and to say, maybe we can move beyond some of our wars 
and start to embrace as a people that it really is up to our generation to figure this out. We're the ones. We are the ones that were born at this time. So where does my work fit into this? So for the past several years, I've researched blended learning, which is really the combination of three things. It's online learning, where students have some control over the time, place, path, and piece of their learning, combined with coming to school, coming to a supervised brick and mortar setting. And then the modalities are connected to create an integrated learning experience. So if a student is learning some of his math online, say in the computer lab or under a tree, and then comes to the face-to-face -face portion of that math course to meet with the teacher or with a guide or with a peer, then that instruction picks up where he last left off. So the idea in blended learning is that there's data that connects the different modalities, whatever they may be, to create more or less of a seamless learning experience. And that's really what blended learning is. And in my mind, when you think about student-centered learning, it really includes personalized learning, which Scott referred to. It includes competency-based learning. And those are the main pillars of student-centered learning. But how do you bring that to scale? How do we, as a, as, a, as a community, allow everyone to have access to that and not just the privilege to have access to a personal, uh, personal tutor, which would be the gold star of personalized learning? Really, to bring that to scale for everyone, we need to leverage technology. And so the only reason that, that personalized learning at scale is possible today is because of the arrival of online learning as a disruptive innovation that allows us to bring those experiences to more students. So you take student-centered learning and you raise it to the power of blended learning, and that's how you get student-centered learning at scale, in my opinion. One critical distinction is even though a classroom might have a whiteboard, it might even have one-to-one -one computers, does not necessarily mean that it's blended. And that's a critical distinction. We have poured over $100 billion, $100 billion in the past few decades into schools, decking them out with more technology and more gadgets. And yet our score, we haven't seen what I'm talking about. We still have the factory model. So we're not quite catching the vision here. And so blended learning is where we actually give students some control over the time, place, path, and pace of their learning. And it'll give them that agency so that we're beyond this and towards this student-centered idea that we're all starting to converge on. So a little over a year ago, Raise Your Hand Texas, which is a nonprofit based in Austin that does, well, actually, they're Austin, Houston, and San Antonio. They have a few different locations. But they um, came to me over a year ago, and they said, if you were to do something at scale in Texas to help support these new ideas, what would you do? And I thought about it for a while, and then came back to them and said, I think what we need in Texas is an opportunity funnel. We need a way to just <coughs> expose more districts and more teachers and families and parents to the vocabulary of student-centered learning. And then from there, let's choose a handful of them, maybe 75, 85, and really train them, help them understand how to write a successful business plan for moving forward with these ideas, and then choose 10 finalists to cultivate further, and then five to actually fund. And so raise your hand and said, yes, let's do it. And this is what I'm involved in now, and I thought I'd share it with you since I'm here in Texas, and it might be interesting for you to know some of the things that are underway right now in our state to move forward with the vision. So we've gotten through the, the point of, um, of the marketing, and then the, in the fall, we did the 75 workshops. As the, the workshops were 75 teams. We now have 10 finalists, 10 districts and charters in the state that are at the finalist level. Their final drafts are due March 1st. And from there, Raise Your Hand Texas will choose the five winners that will serve as demonstration sites for the rest of the state to say, this is possible. It is actually possible to turn a big ship in Texas. And we're going to be the five demonstra demonstration sites that help to light the way forward for doing that. So that's how Raising Blended Learners was born. And I'll show you the marketing piece. They have a great marketing team there, I think. And they, they put together this piece. Do you remember the top part of the funnel? To just expose the 1,200 
districts to the to the vocabulary. So this is the marketing piece, just a quick video that they put together to just whet the appetite. Blended learning combines online instruction with traditional schooling, where students have some control over when, how, and where they learn. I just I just love doing computers because it's fun. I'm learning a lot in math and in reading. With 35 year olds and having 10 on computers and 10 doing work and 10 with teachers was really different, um, but I, I love it. Oh, what's the word? Came. Very good. This would be camp. It's really yes. great and you're able to take a group of five kids, differentiate it, make sure it's at their level, and get kids to learn the skills that they need to be independent readers by the end of kindergarten, which is just amazing to see. How do you know that the sunlight does not touch the carrots? We do what's called flip lessons. We have our classwork done at home and our homework done in class. 40, 46. I knew that there would be a chance to have a lot of small group time with kids, and that's something that I love. A tanogram is many shapes that are put together in a way to create something, and it can be put together in any way. So it will print on the cardboard. So each month they take an assessment through iStation. As teachers, we're able to view those results as well and see where percentile ranking they are, see what areas they're struggling with. I can try to get Gigi, he's a penguin, back to his own iceberg. I'm so close, like this close. So you're not just getting Gigi to his iceberg, but at the same time, you're learning more math. Are developing across Texas now and as these pilot schools and teams are starting to think through how would we actually demonstrate this let me show you a bit about the ideas that are bubbling up and I'm going to just talk to you about some of the models that are starting to to be in the minds of the leaders in our state and the first that I'll talk to you about is the station rotation model and that's where students are rotating at the teachers discretion or at the ring of a bell among different modalities and so they might do small group instruction with a teacher for, say, 20 minutes, and then online learning for 20 minutes, and then, say, project-based learning for 20 minutes, and then they rotate. And one of the benefits of that is that it lowers the effect of student-teacher ratio so that those students who are meeting with the teacher can have more tailored instruction for where they are with the content. And then it also, when they're doing the online station, allows them to interact with, uh, hopefully, ideally, uh, ideally, with interesting content that's game-like and that can then, then feed the data to the teacher to know where those students are. And so we have more fluid ability groupings. And when we trained these 75 teams in the fall, we actually modeled this model for the team so that they would feel it. So the workshops were different from a typical workshop where you might be sitting like that for the whole day. And instead, for part of the time they were meeting with me or another facilitator, Part of the time they were doing small group work and part of the time they were learning online themselves. And so it was interesting for them to actually feel. And one of the complaints we got from adults at first was, there's so much movement. We have to walk around this room so much. We can't handle it. And it was so different for them. And also in the small group time, the fact that they had to actually have these discussions, Socratic discussions together, as instead of having a teacher direct them through them, New things for adults to be learning as well in this, in, these, in this day and age, and not just the children. So let me, I, I got these great video, uh, photos from Millipedus Unified School District in Northern California that I thought should, I'd share with you, just to give you a sense for the station rotation. So oftentimes the teacher will designate these are the different stations that we're working through today. If they don't get through all of those different cycles, then they would just pick up where they left off the next time. And this girl, um, Alice, is the timekeeper. So she 
declares, I'm ready to learn after 20 minutes. And then everyone else has to stop and say, I'm ready to learn too. And that's how they know that it's time to rotate to their next station. This is Jennifer, and she's ahead with her math. So she's putting her name on the board as someone who can guide her peers. And then on the other column are those who need help, who are stuck. And oftentimes in the more effective implementations, you see these pairings where students become peer support for each other to help them. It's common as they start to be all over the map with where they are. They're moving at their own pace. And so you can start to even allow students to drive their learning and to be running partners for each other in some of these models. And then on the left here, uh, on the right here is Allison, and she is proudly um, showing that she's halfway through sixth grade math, even though she's a fourth grader. And I think it just reflects that these models can really allow those who are behind to, to rewind and replay and, and, and focus in until they get it and get that additional help and support. And meanwhile, the students who are ready to move forward can do so. And so it's really the idea of the universal design. And instead of just designing for the average, we're designing so that we have a way for those on either end to make progress in a way that meets their needs at the moment. That's personalized learning. So where are we in Texas with this? So one of our 10 finalists is Cisco ISD outside of Fort Worth. And they're saying we're going to use a rotational model to serve our first two eighth graders better, specifically in math and science. And so they're trying to get their heads around how can we use these new technologies to revamp our math and science instruction. Georgetown ISD, outside of Austin, they have a three-part strategy. They're going to develop personalized learning plans for their pre-K through third graders. They're also revamping their middle school math and science. And now they're asking this really important question, which is, what is the right model for our high school students? And it might not even be a station rotation. It might be something more flexible that really delivers that agency, where we know students at that level are starting to be ready for it. And then Isleta is way over in El Paso, right on the border of Mexico. And they've done one-to-one -one computing for a while, where each student has a device. And like I said, cramming more devices into the classroom is not necessarily going to get us where we want to go as a country. And so what they've discovered is that their scores have not really improved. Their results haven't gotten much better. They have a big immigrant population. They have a lot of English language learners. And so they're really at this important moment of saying, how do we design a more effective student experience so that we use these devices that we've already invested in in a way that actually redounds to the success of our students. They're doing that critical design work now. And I think that for districts that have already over-invested in technology, the mandate now is to step back and say, how do we redesign the student experience? And then use the technology subordinate to reaching that more lofty vision. And then Point Isabel, on the southern tip of Texas, their superintendent is just passionate about motivation. And so they're working hard to say, how do we redesign in a way that will help our students feel motivated so they see their success every day, they have fun with their friends, and they show up ready to learn every day. So those are some of the rotation models that are, that are on the horizon here in our state. So next I'm going to tell you about flipped classroom. Most of you are familiar with this term at this point. It's become common. And it's the idea of, in the past, we've always consumed the lecture in class and then gone home and done the problem set. And now flipped classroom flips that. So that before class, you would watch the lecture or consume the content online somehow and then come to class to do the problem set or application, or now increasingly teachers are becoming imaginative about what is the best use of that precious face-to-face -face time if the students have already enjoyed the content the night before. And so watch how Aaron Sams, who's one of the fathers of the flipped classroom, has answered that question. I think he does a really imaginative job of rethinking what is the best use of face-to-face -face time. <coughs>
And so we're seeing some districts that are thinking about flipped classrooms. Uh, Birdville ISD is a conservative district outside of Fort Worth. And conservative in the sense that they haven't seen a lot of change. Their community maybe would be described as a, as a community that's more reluctant to change. And yet they've increasingly seen um, a rising immigration population and they really need to change. They're struggling with their literacy scores. And so their intent on figuring out how to flip their classroom and add rotational elements to improve their approach to literacy in Birdville ISD. And then Kip Houston, right here in your neighborhood, is doing some tremendous work identifying the fact that the eighth grade Algebra 1 completion is a gateway indicator for success through college. And their theory is that one of the main ways to help students escape the cycle of poverty is by helping them successfully go from eighth grade Algebra 1 all the way through AP Math in high school and they're intent on figuring out how to do that for Kipsters. And so they're reinventing their math program for that eighth grade through high school um, continuum to design it in a way that will work better for these students, give them agency, and help them succeed all the way through AP math. And then uh, another model to talk about is the flex model, which Scott has already uh, revealed his bias for this one. So flex is really where now online learning is the backbone of content and instruction. And there's still a face-to-face -face teacher of record, but the class moves more on a flexible, individual, as-needed basis through the content, working with the teacher as a facilitator or guide or coach to work at their own pace and move through the curriculum um, in the way that works best for them. And that's the flex model. He also alluded to the fact that this discovery of this new way of thinking about classroom arrangement, and oftentimes these aren't even called classrooms anymore, by the way, they're more like studios. They don't look like a traditional classroom anymore. And when I first discovered this, I think it was in 2010, and I was living with my family in Honolulu, Hawaii. I have five little children. And it was interesting to be researching blended learning at the same time as sending my children to a school that had none of that. And, and I think many of you are probably in the same boat as parents who are more aware of some of the changes that are underway than others might be. And you, it creates this cognitive dissonance, I think, to try and, I'm seeing a lot of nods. It's true, right? As a parent, you feel it. So as part of our research, I was assigned to profile 40 schools that were, or organizations that were early adapters of blended learning and even to figure out what they meant by blended learning. In 2010, people didn't know what that was and is that hybrid learning? What is blended learning? And one of the schools was a micro school in Austin, Texas called Acton Academy. And I was so enamored with this model that I convinced my sweet husband that we literally needed to move to Austin, Texas so we could send our kids to this school, <laughs> which we did. So this is where we are now. If you want to find us, we are thoroughly, and I hope they're there right now as a matter of fact. But the way that this school works is that um, in the morning time, usually, it's core skills. And a lot of those skills are learned using online resources and lessons, which frees the students up to work at their own pace. They also are running partners for each other. And there are also the guides that are in the room to help them on their journeys. They are on a journey, in fact, a hero's journey to realize their callings in life. And this is one of the tools that they're given to accomplish that journey. And then to, to really manage their own learning, one of the questions I get is, how do people teach students to do that? And so they've pioneered and taken inspiration from Summit Public Schools, this learning cycle, where the students at the beginning of the week would, would set their goals for the week and make a plan. Some of the behaviors that work for us as successful adults in the workplace and then learn and pursue the accomplishment of those goals, show evidence that they have accomplished those and mastered those skills, and then reflect, how did it go? Was I in my zone? Was I in my challenge zone? Was I in my panic zone? Was I too much in my comfort zone? And reflect and then be prepared to do that same learning cycle the next week. That leads to such efficiencies in their learning to know that they really can spend the rest of the day learning to do and learning to be. So in the afternoon, they do a lot of project-based learning. And then they also do huddles that are Socratic discussion. A plus up has a lot of similar elements, which I discovered yesterday in, in meeting with the 
amazing coaches from A plus up. So there are districts that are inspired by this flex model. In Grand Prairie, the Young Women's Leadership Academy, grades six through eight, is now growing into grades nine through 12. And they are intent on, they have said, 50% of our high school students need to be flex model. That's it. They've thrown down the gauntlet. And um, Pasadena, right here in your neighborhood as well, has already moved forward with four of their schools through an initiative called Pasadena Connect which is modeled after Summit Public Schools, a successful charter network in Silicon Valley. And again, it's flex model, project-based learning, avid note-taking, Socratic discussion, those great elements woven together. And it's about the student experience, right? I'm not telling you which devices are software. It's really about how do we rethink the blend of the student experience to create something that works and is more satisfying for our students and happier, by the way, for our teachers in most of these circumstances as well. And then Tulia ISD and the panhandle between Amarillo and, Tex and, and Lubbock. And they have wanted to bring more opportunities for their students, courses that before were out of reach, and they're leveraging the flex model. So the last I'll mention is the enriched virtual model. And that's where students might come to school two days a week or two days a month. It really is a more of a virtual school model, but enriched with brick and mortar face-to-face -face experiences. And in fact, this model got its start as virtual schools realized that more of their, as they were growing, so many students can thrive in purely virtual settings. They needed, unless they had a parent that could homeschool them, they needed more support. And so they started to build learning centers and places where you could come for that brick and mortar support. And that's how the enriched virtual model was born. When we were living in Hawaii, is when I saw my first enriched virtual, there was a school there that. Uh, served a variety of students, some of whom were professional surfers. And so it was hard for them to come to school every day and show up in a traditional environment. And so I know we're just out of jealous right now. And so they would do their work online and then come to school for the, and as long as they kept their grades at a certain baseline, then this model was okay for them. And I think it's just a reflection of the emerging truth, which is that we no longer have to think about school as which one model are we going to standardize around. And I hope you're not thinking, which is the one model that's right for my students? Because really what we're emerging towards is the idea that there are a variety of ways to piece together learning experiences to meet the individual needs and circumstances of each of our students and families in their context. And so it used to be that that was, would have been prohibitively expensive and complicated. But thanks to the breakthrough innovations that we've seen as a society, we are now able to imagine and really create these schools that are able to serve in a variety of ways. So uh, Cypress Fairbanks right here in the Houston area is doing a rotation plan for their first through eighth graders. But the interesting disruptive innovation that they have in mind is a teacher's academy that will probably be more of an enriched virtual model that will allow those teachers to do some of their learning on their own and then have the face-to-face -face community to also extend and enhance their learning. And so you can see how these models can also work for teacher development and thinking through which of these models would be the right one for you if you were to learn something new. And so let's just think now about where do we go from here? How do we get started? If you're a classroom teacher, do we have any classroom teachers here today? Or are you oh, a lot? Of, well, welcome. I hope this is your, worth your substitute teaching time. Um, <laughs> so, um, so if you're a classroom teacher without a lot of support from the district or even from your principal, generally the most accessible way to get started is with what we at the Christensen Institute would call a sustaining innovation, an innovation that improves upon the traditional model, doesn't throw the traditional classroom out the door, but brings online learning on board to, to improve upon it. So the more sustaining models of blended learning would be a station rotation, a lab rotation, a flipped classroom. Flipped classroom is probably the easiest to do if you're completely on your own. If you don't have really any, te I know te teachers that have gone to a workshop, learned about flipped classroom, and done it that very weekend. And so if you have a situation where your students have devices, that can be a, a low hanging fruit for you. And then the other models as well. Now let's say you're a, a school leader, or a principal, or a district leader. It's really up to you to be the senior leaders 
who say we are going to champion some disruptive initiatives in our school or in our district. And so it really takes that senior leader to carve out the autonomy for a team to start to be disruptive. And the best way to get started with disruptive innovation is to find an area where students otherwise wouldn't be served. Those are your safe harbors for innovation. So maybe you don't have summer school right now. Maybe you're not offering Chinese. Maybe you don't have um, after school programming. Maybe there are students who've dropped out altogether and you want to pioneer a new model that will help bring them back. Those are really great safe harbors to get started with a more disruptive innovation, more of a flex model or an enriched virtual model or some of the other disruptive models that we haven't discussed today. So it's really up to the senior leaders to think through how to carve out that autonomous space and say, we're going to create a school within a school and we're going to figure this out. And then as that innovation becomes good enough down the road, start to bring it towards the mainstream. In fact, Pasadena, ISD, which I mentioned, is one of those districts that's starting to say, you know, we have these four schools that have been doing the flex model for a little while. We're ready to start thinking about bringing this more towards our mainstream students in core classrooms. And then finally, for everyone, I hope that we just are wise enough to recognize between technology-rich instruction, which is cramming more technology into our students' already busy, noisy, crowded, and complicated lives, and instead stepping back and designing designing those student experiences, designing the teacher experiences. How do we make schooling a place where we can recruit and retain the best people in America? And designing those teacher experiences and, um, and being those who can help differentiate between moving forward with one-to-one -one devices, which I would not recommend, and instead doing the important work of designing the better ways of learning. I am so confident in um, your abilities. I really think that we have an increasing convergence around the idea that it's, it's really ours. It's our job to, to figure this out. We're not in the industrial era anymore. It's a networked age. And if not us, who's going to do it? It's really up to us to, to, to figure out this new blend. And we see districts and charters and micro schools in Texas that are already starting to lead the way, which is promising. I think our state is positioned to be <coughs> leaders in recreating the, the experience of schooling, not just for the state, but really for the country. And that, in turn, there's a lot of eyes on America to figure out how we're doing this. So this is an important time to be living in Houston, Texas, doing this work. And finally, I would commend classroom teachers to doing what you can within your own domain to improve your practice by leveraging online learning in ways that will help you personalize learning to some extent, meet students at their individual level better, have more fluid ability groupings. I would commend school leaders to taking on disruptive projects, to saying, we're going to do this initiative to improve our credit recovery program. And other people might not think credit recovery should deserve this much attention, but I do. Because I know I'm playing for the end game, and in the end, that work we're doing with credit recovery to figure out how to do a flex lab there, that's our learning laboratory, safe harbor, and we're going to take it now to the rest of our school. And then for all of us, can we be the wise stewards of our resources to help differentiate between technology-rich instruction and help to nudge this system towards more authentic student-centered learning? I believe we can. I really think there's more power in all of us than we know and that the opportunity is now for our students and for our teachers and for our schools. So join me as we dream of these new designs for our students and as we lead the way as the teachers and as we create these better schools. Thank you. <laughs>